Well, thanks very much. It's really exciting to be here. It's exciting to be learning about the, the humanities truck. Uh, and as, as Dan said, um, we sort of started out on a very similar road in 1982 uh, when I was in Philadelphia for a couple of years. And we ended up with a kind of moving festival carried in a city bus where you could, uh, the, the big transformation was originally we started with the idea that, well, we'll have a bus and people can get on in the front and there'll be an exhibit and then they go through and come out the back. And we very quickly realized that wasn't either interesting or particularly uh, helpful. And so we ended up working our way to the idea of the bus is a moving set of resources that could go anywhere and deploy. And we ended up using it as a way to transport a series of aluminum frames that could be opened up with umbrellas that went over the top and put in any configuration and then have Velcro exhibit materials stretched around these rectangular frames and suddenly you had a festival in a neighborhood. And um, we had done, a, I was with something called the Philadelphia Social History Project then which was doing a lot of work with census data and the couple, I'd gone back to Buffalo by the time it was actually rolling, but I came down a few times to ride the truck. And what made a huge impression of me was we had all these census printouts from uh, a neighborhood in 1880, and we'd be in the same neighborhood. And so we could do this whole thing of talking with people about who lived in their house 100 years ago, and then collaboratively interpreting the result, just as an example of how the history really becomes important. In one case that I remember, it was an Irish neighborhood. And um, people would say, well, gosh, I don't see many kids. I thought the Irish had a lot of kids. And there are all these people, and they, they don't seem to have kids in the house. And we'd say, well, let's take a closer look at them. Well, how old are these people? Well, they were all in their mid-40s in, in this particular neighborhood. Well, it didn't say they didn't have kids. It said their kids are not in the house. And then we had other data that showed that the average age of leaving home in, at that time for boys was 13 and for girls was uh, 12. Girls were going out to be servants. The boys were often apprenticed uh, to an artisan. And so the fundamental experience of adolescence, we had great discussions about this, were that any of you with teenage kids will respond to this, that the modal experience at that time was that young people were living under adult supervision, but not their parents. They were not in school. They were not in high school, which was just getting started. But they were not in this situation of rubbing up against, you know, at just as the hormones and everything else are exploding, they were under adult supervision, but not with a direct parental relationship, which is a very different way to grow up than was true even 20 or 30 years after that. So all of this came on a day-to-day -day basis. I was joking with Dan before. We, we had written a, a huge grant. We weren't as successful as you all have been with the humanities truck. So we didn't get the big NEH public programs thing we were looking for. So we had to do it very modestly. But when we were planning the big thing, we worked with a very um, powerful designer, actually came out of theater and event planning, not, not your average exhibit designer, a guy named Jim Hamilton in New Hope, Pennsylvania. We went up to his studio and he said, he really tried to coax out our ideas. And he, we said, well, we, we thought, you know, if you're in this neighborhood, you could like have a, a big map of the neighborhood like you have on the side of your truck, but of the neighborhood. And then people could maybe look up the census and figure out who was in their house and get a color-coded thing and go up and put it on the map. And then over the week that you were there, you would have a map of the social composition of that neighborhood would appear. Isn't that cool? And he said, oh, that's, that's very cool. How big were you thinking about this map being? And we said, oh, you know, really big. I mean, maybe, you know, um, you know from here to there, maybe 20 feet tall and uh, 20 feet wide and 15 feet tall. He said, oh, that's interesting. He said, I was thinking about two city blocks. You know, with scaffolds and maybe little elevators that you could get, and people would go up. So we realized we were in a different uh, ballpark in terms of our ambition. But fortunately, perhaps we didn't get the big grant, so we ended up with census printouts, and we did what we could. All right, so let me, having made my connection to the history truck, let me try to run through a good bit of material here. Um, and that goes really from stuff that I've been involved with for a long time, and will end up with the stuff that we're doing now. So the thing that um, 
many people uh, know about my work um, is a book that came out in 1990, really almost 30 years ago, called A Shared Authority. And I'm not sure how many people read it. And certainly, I know how few people buy it. But um, they sure do quote the title. And it's become uh, a kind of mantra in a lot of oral history that we want to share authority. And that's certainly a, an animating uh, principle, I think, in a lot of what uh, you're involved with in something like the humanities truck. The thing that I would really want to emphasize, and certainly it's in terms of how I got to a lot of this, is that the book is a set of essays. Uh, and there, it's often referred to because there are these things that ascend to something that you might call theory in, in terms of thinking about what memory is and what, what um, authorship is and what dialogue is and so forth. But the fascinating thing, I thought, is that every single essay in that book came out of a concrete project with communities, usually, or in some form or another. Uh, an exhibit, looking at how people respond to exhibits, everything in the book, out of which, if it's theory, that's where it came, was coming from reflection on real practice. So um, as opposed to the trickle-down notion of academic work, that we do the scholarship and you all then disseminate it um, out there, this is really, if anything, closer to the opposite. It's if you have practice and you're out there doing things, and if you step back and say, what is this really, what am I learning from this, and how can that transform what we're doing in a classroom, um, you begin to, um, I think, come closer to certainly what my trajectory has been. The second point that was, goes back even before that to the first, the first thing I ever did in oral history, we had a group of highly political um, graduate students in our American Studies program who, um, in this case, they were all Trotskyists. If you know much about the left, they tend to be very good organizers. Trying to, I mean, you need to do that if you're going to have a worldwide revolution and not just you know, talk about the Soviet Union. So um, they ended up scarfing some funding and created a journal. And the journal was called, we had an Indian program, and they were all Trotskyists, so the journal was called Red Buffalo, and, uh, which they thought was clever. I suppose we all thought it was clever at the time. And they were trying to build content. They wanted to do a special issue on oral history. First issue was on native people, and the second issue, theme issue, was on oral history. So they came around to, I was a new faculty member then, and they came around and they said, well, could you write something on oral history? And I said, well, I don't know anything about oral history. I've never really even done it. But I happened to be reading um, Studs Terkel's book, Hard Times, for my survey course. And I said, well, I'm reading this book now, which is an oral history of the Great Depression. And they said, well, great, write, a, write an essay about it. Do a review essay. So to help them out, I ended up doing this review essay. And it introduced me really to a whole lot of things about oral history, which I really hadn't thought much about or even known much about before. And what I found, um, I think as with a lot of things, even that had a kind of public dimension. Since I didn't know anything about the topic, I took the cheapest, uh, most obvious route possible. I looked at the paperback I had, and I looked at all the blurbs on the back that would tell me what the book was all about. And then I started reading the book. And more and more, I got a sense that there was a, a very odd disconnect, that the book, the blurbs were all things about, this will make you proud to be an American. This is an anthem in praise of the American spirit. This is the wonderful way that we triumphed over the Depression. And I read the book, and it was, you know, it was about ruined lives. It was about anger. It was about very, very complex relationships. So I began looking at what was going on in the book and, and doing this essay, which is the first chapter in a share, well, it's one of the cha early chapters in a shared authority. And the position I came to, Studs Terkel begins that book, line one. Line one is, this is a memory book. And I said, well, what does that mean? Why is that different than a history book? Well, it's not a history book, it's a memory book. So that got me thinking about what is the relationship between memory and history, which runs through a number of those essays. And what I found very quickly, and it also appeared in a number of the essays, that the two broad positions at that point that dominated the um, discourse of oral history, so-called, it wasn't much of a discourse, but when people talked about it, was what I would call no history and more history. So the more, I'll reverse them. I think I ought to change the slide. The more history, something familiar in an academic institution, 
is the idea that oral history is just another way to get data that we wouldn't ordinarily have because people didn't write letters unless they're Thomas Jefferson or John Adams, but they sure had experience and they, you know. So oral history is a way to get stuff. And then we historians will then put that through our mills and turn it into the narratives or the analyses that we construct. The other approach is that get rid of all these intellectuals. Oral history is the voice of the people. All you have to do is really listen to them and not be swept away with all this academic jive, and you will somehow apprehend the way it was, which is also a lot of the blurbs were about this is the way it was. This is the way it was. Just listen to them. They'll tell you how it would. And the more I looked at it, I thought, well, neither of those positions is really very helpful. I mean, clearly, there's more going on here than just raw data. And clearly, if you read with any sensitivity at all, these narratives are full of contradictions, of complexities, of all sorts of things that require some interpretation. It's not just the way it was. It was the way, A, people remember it. Surprise, surprise. They're writing in interviews are in the late 60s. Some things were going on in the late 60s, uh, I think. Um, and in fact, the interviews are f suffused with generational tensions, with people who lost their own youth you know, because of the Depression, watching their kids with all of this privilege and freedom in the you know, emerging baby boom and having very mixed feelings about a lot of it. So you'll see this if you go back to the book. As it happened, when they pulled the, um, the, journal, the journal together, they ended up commissioning an introduction and it was the no history. The guy said, this is the way it is. And they were all Trotskyists. They knew a lot about, you know, they'd read their Gramsci. They knew a lot about false consciousness. They knew a lot about, you know, they knew the Frankfurt School. They knew all of it. So the idea that you just turn on a faucet and any worker or is spouting the truth really requires a little more intervention. So they ended up writing in totally Marxist terms a counter introduction. If you can find the journal, I, my, my Turkle essay got a lot of notice. And I, I always felt that what launched my career in oral history was publishing an article that people talked about in a journal that nobody could find. <laughs> so it's a, a great strategy. I mean, you know, it's nice if you can get into one of the top journals, but if not, find something really obscure. And, and uh, where's Red Buffalo? How do we get a copy of Red Buffalo? People writing from Australia saying, you know, we took out a subscription and we, it, we didn't get anything except this, the second issue. Well, it, that's all there were, were two issues. Anyway, so um, that led me into what runs through a lot of the book, that memory and history are really interesting and complicated, the way I've certainly have thought of it for a long time. Uh, I, and I do a lot of wordplay in the book, including in the, in the title. If nothing else, the, the word authority is clearly related to the word uh, author. And who is the author of an oral history? Well, it's not the interviewer, and it's not quite the interviewee. It's somehow a dialogic construction that happens in the present. Memory, if you think of it, only happens in the present or whenever the memory is recorded. It's looking back, but it comes into the present as a memory. History is just there. It's back there in 1843 or whenever you're looking. And then you can step back and try to interpret it, but the history has a better claim at having some sort of fixed reality. Memory is by definition contextual and contingent and fluid and constructed after the fact, depending on what it's important to remember, what people do remember, how they mobilize that memory, how they use it, what it means to them, and on and on and on. So lots of complexity to memory and history. And if you look through some of the stuff in shared authority, you'll get some sense of that. So that kind of launched me in oral history. And I'll sort of jump forward a little bit. Um, after that book came out, um, maybe towards the end of the 90s or really the early 20th century, I began to just play around a little bit with what you couldn't even quite call it digital, but it's essentially beginning to think a little more. We were having digital interviews then, and digital recorders were just coming in and so forth. And then I saw demonstrated at a meeting of the Oral History Association, as it happened coincidentally, it was in Buffalo, um, in I think 1988, nine, 1998 or 1999, 
And I saw demonstrated a piece of market research software that could be used to actually index audio and video. Originally audio, and then soon after that, video. Indexing almost in exactly the same sense that you think of an index to a book. I'm interested in mothers and daughters, and on page 84, and 208, and 314, if you go to those pages, there'll be a story about mothers and daughters. And I could take notes on those and make a class presentation on mothers and daughters as they appear in this set of interviews or something like that. So the idea that you could index the actual recording, um, which is what this software helped us to do. It's, it didn't do it itself. It's just like a word processor that allowed you to, you'll see it in a second, mark things up. Opened up this whole larger world that I, here I was getting all involved in oral history. We do it because there's something priceless about these people and their voices and their emotion and their affect and their everything. And then nobody listens to the recordings, usually, conventionally, never, because they're impossible to work with. They're not really easy to reach. If some of you, if you know the history of the field, in the early years of oral history, after something was transcribed at Columbia, you know, the ur source for oral history, they destroyed the recordings. Because who needs them? We've got to transcribe. That's the, in many archives still, unless it's transcribed, it will not be accepted for the archive. And it's nice if you have the media and they'll find some place to put it where it's kind of deep six beyond anybody's ability to retrieve it, but they're really just dealing with the text. So that raised the larger question of thinking about what is the primary source in oral history? What do we do with the recordings? Um, and to what extent do they have a claim to in fact being the primary text? The transcription is a rendition with many, many problems and uh, many, many advantages, because you can read it and you can, especially now, you can search it easily. But, you know, as I've observed almost from the beginning, it's very tricky. Transcripts are great, but, you know, they're very, very treacherous to work with. People in interviews, a famous example a friend of mine once had, people in interviews are not likely to say, let me tell you a story about the social construction of gender. Uh, you don't get much of that. But they tell stories. And any indexer, which we've had around for several hundred years, could say, these are all stories, whether it's about the kitchen, or it's about dating, or it's about career choice. These are about the social construction of gender. And they put that in their index. And you go there, and you find these stories that could have lots of different. I saw an interview a while back that was all about a, a major labor struggle. <laughs> the word strike was never used, because they all knew it was a strike. They just referred to it by any number of terms. They didn't have to say the strike of 1958 you know, in Sheboygan. They just said, you know, over down when, you know, Carrier went out, went out. Well, that meant that the men were on strike. But the word, so word searches, very tricky, lots of things. So we began to play with this software. It's called Interclipper. It's not, we still use it a lot in the back end. It's not terribly, it never made the, uh, leap to the internet, uh, and maybe it will at some point. But what I've learned with a lot of different software tools is they're all good for something. And if you could put them all together, um, you'd really have something. Everything has some real advantages. Interclipper has some spectacular ones that I'll be illustrating in just a minute or two. And it led us to what we called multidimensional indexing. And this is move. So the index, you have that idea. We are familiar with it from books. But if you're thinking about themes that run through something like an interview collection, simply throwing tags at it, whether they're social construction of gender or anything else, is going to produce a pretty illegible tag cloud or a pretty illegible index, so all these sorts of things. I used to say in my graduate seminars, if you have a really tough book, um, a good approach to it, for those of you who are graduate students, it's still good advice. A good approach is go to the index, look for those indented paragraphs where there are 35 sub-references. Those are probably pretty important ideas 
somewhere in that book. And if you study those, you then go back and start reading, or use the index even, to read selectively to follow those threads, and you have a better chance than if you start on page one and turn the book with your purple underliner into a, a purple screed, which is what most of our students, uh, my students often, often do. So, but indexes are, there are a lot more possibility. We were led to this idea of what we called multidimensional indexing, and I can give you a somewhat prosaic, quick description of that. We ended up calling it, we later learned, because we didn't know what we were really doing at the beginning, so we later learned a lot of library um, terminology to describe this, but we didn't have that under control. So we ended up coming to the notion of what we called the CVS approach to multidimensional indexing. And we didn't mean the drugstore. What we meant, which will sound even more mysterious, is CVS stood for Chinese Vegetable and Spicy. Chinese Vegetable and Spicy. So what does that mean? Well, what it meant is that, and we actually had this discussion often with clients that we were working with, that if you imagined having a database of, let's say, 10,000 recipes, okay, and you're constructing you know, banquet menus, let's say. You've got 10,000 recipes. If some, and you've brought out a dish and say, I think we should use this one. And if somebody said to you, well, that's interesting. Is that dish Chinese or vegetable? You would immediately say, well, that's a stupid question. You know, it happens to be Chinese and vegetable. But another one might be Chinese and shrimp. And another one might be Chinese and, you know, tofu. Those are what the social scientists call independent variables. Ethnicity has nothing to do with ingredients. Neither of them have anything to do, by definition, with whether it's spicy or not spicy or any other taste quality you could define. Um, and so therefore, you could imagine working with that um, in a multidimensional way, say, well, I want to first search on ethnicity. I've got too many Chinese dishes. I want some that are Tuscan or whatever. And then you could work with ingredients. And then you could come at it through making sure that they weren't all too spicy or not spicy enough. And you would manipulate these. So it seemed, and it has seemed, a pretty straightforward idea if you apply it to that kind of notion of a database of recipes, each of which has ingredients. And, it has, and you could go on and have a field for cooking time or nutritional value or almost anything else you could imagine. But they would all be independent variables that could be mixed and matched and put together any way you want. So the question then became, can you apply that to stories, which are generally not something that appear to people very naturally? What are the dimensions of stories that might be as different from each other as Chinese as ethnicity, ingredient, and taste quality. And that could be independent variables that could be mixed and matched. So we were led into the Interclipper software was very good at having three what they call control vocabulary fields. So you could create a taxonomy and then code the passages that we were identifying independently in each of these fields. And then you could have ways, which you'll see in a second, of sorting them to get the spiciness together with, with Neapolitan or whatever, whatever it might be, and, and juke it around until you got the combinations that you wanted. So um, a couple of things, and then I'll show you a really good example of this. Um, some quick points here. They're all, these are all pretty, pretty obvious. I've already actually touched on one of them. Catalogs, which is what librarians are most comfortable with are really good at finding books or objects or anything. But once you've got it, they're not very good at telling you what's in it. That's what indexes are all about. So most of the library systems we have are much better at cataloging, not surprisingly, than they are at really describing the content in a way that allow you to enter it and move around and find things. So um, there are a lot of barriers to this kind of indexing. Uh, and you run into the limits of cataloging almost immediately. I mean, it became very clear as we began this work that a catalog that points you to an important book 
is still pretty valuable because you've got the book in your hand. If it's just pointing you to a three-hour interview, you've got nothing, unless you have three hours to listen to the whole thing. And even then, you're not likely to, to stay awake <laughs> or be able to find anything in it. So the need to somehow map the content at a more granular level in oral history, given that the time demands of screening a lot of material are extraordinary in the media form, um, led us to the idea of, of this kind of indexing that we were doing. Text dependency, I've, I've, I've already mentioned a little bit, can be very, very limited. It's, if anything, more and more powerful now because of how easy it is to search on texts. But you have to be very careful about it. Um, I have this reference there, and some of you may want to write it down. This is a big project out of Michigan State called Oral History in the Digital Age, I think about four years ago. But they brought all sorts of people together. Their website, it's still pretty good and, and reasonably current. And I think they've done even some updating. But there are at least 40 or 50 working papers up on that site about almost any from recording quality, from recording issues to digital recorders to media to television, I mean, all sorts of stuff, and a lot of the stuff that, that I've been involved with and have been talking about. So let me give you an example. We began by, they gave us essentially four, I think it's maybe 14 or 18 hours of childhood stories from about 15 of these interviews. So about 25 or 30 minutes from each one that were essentially their childhood before they got to whatever they did later on in their life. And so we decided, let's try to index this and see what we um, can come up with. So it looks a little bit like this. Um, this, was, this was in video. You can't really see, the, see much, but I can point you a couple of things. So this is an interview with a woman named Monique Davis. And that's her picture there. Over here. Monique Davis, there are three sections, each one about 20 minutes long, growing up, um, coming of age, and then a sort of highlight quote that they had picked out that they thought was really one of the things they wanted noted in her interview. So right now, we're looking at this section called growing up. And these are all the passages within that that were identified as being, in some ways, notable. Um, and each one has a name. And then each one has a series of codes that are um, assigned to it. And the one that's highlighted here, the name is community child rearing. Up here, you see there are these little flags. You can't quite see the colors, but the color is, is a brighter blue. And that means when you click on that, it goes to this point, and it starts playing, and it stops when it gets to that point. And you could do that with anything in the 30 hours of recordings. So you have instant access to specific passages of audio or video. And then you, so, so that's one example in Monique Davis's thing. And I'll get to the codes in just a second. These are the codes. And I won't walk you through the whole CVS thing. But we learned a lot from doing this very, very broadly. You certainly can't read it. The left-hand column, topic A, we tried to simply denote the real content of the story. What's it about? The second column was trying to locate that story. And you want to think back to the CVS example. Locate that story within a life course development. It's about you know, leaving home. You know, even though the content of the story might be moving from Mississippi to um, Chicago. It's about leaving home, or it's about joining the military, or it's about something else. The third column, and it goes on actually, there's several others. The third column is essentially context. So is this this Jim Crow era? Is it a story about World War II? Is it a story about desegregation? So we can locate it. And suddenly, you begin to see, in this case, you could have, I'll take another example, a, friend call, a, a thing called old friends. Over here, it could be something that is about valuing education. And over here, it could be Jewish-black relations. And that would be a story of an old friend who 
was Jewish, who had an influence on somebody, and so forth. So you would juke around in these, uh, these uh, you know, kind of labeling possibilities, and ultimately the idea was to find your way to stories that satisfied a particular kind of, of curiosity. So you'd code it, and then the quick example, we're back in Monique Davis's um, oral history. There's that uh, one highlighted called communal child rearing. Um, one of the cool things in Interclipper is that you just take any of these column heads and move it up here, and it sorts out everything that's displayed according to its values in that field. And you could bring up a second field and a third field and get all these. So it's not just finding something, it's giving you a sense of the whole array. These are all the values in column B. And here we have three clips about this, and four clips about that, and eight clips about that, and so forth. So that's in Monique Davis. And we have one of them up there. There's communal child rearing under topic B, shared responsibility. Now we go up to the top of the tree, and we sort the whole collection. And we now see with that same sort, there are now five passages, meaning they're coming out of different interviews. But they all share this set of codes, meaning they're all about something that is resonant with, within that. And I could go into it. There's the shared responsibility lifted up. Um, we do a little more searching around, bring up a second thing. We see there seem to be four people, um, Bob Petty, Ernie Terrell, Monique Davis, and Jolene Lambert, who are all talking about shared responsibility, three of them in, uh, involved with another topic called community character, and a third having a, a fourth, fourth one about education. And the first day we did this, I mean, we had done some work on the coding. My friend Doug Lambert, who was working with me, you know Doug? Um, was just starting with us then, and he said, I keep hearing this story about, you know, other adults in the community disciplining kids who are going out. He said, we got to code that. You know, it, it's coming up a lot. So we coded it, uh, called it shared responsibility. It, later, I think we called it takes a village to raise a child and so forth. So we ended up, there's a couple more, but these were, seem to be the most interesting, these four people. And the first time we did this, it really blew us away. It took us 10 minutes to extract those clips and put them in this slide. So these are out of, I don't know, 13, 14, 18 hours of material. We could go in, use the indexing, find four people who were in some way in dialogue with each other, and here's what they had to say. Go another way. And then going up in a small town again, um, so many people knew so many people working, living, whatever, what have you. Uh, even white people would say to you, saw you doing wrong, hey, aren't you Hazel Petty's boy? Yes, sir. I'm going to tell your mama you boy. That kind of a thing. So, for me, it's a nice place to just grow up. And if one of the children had misbehaved, I remember this as plain as, as my hand. If you misbehave, any of those parents would literally spank you. And I'll never forget going in the street to get a ball. And Mrs. Morgan, who lived a little ways down, she snatched me up and spanked my bottom. And I ran in the house crying. And she, I got it again from my parents because you don't go in the street for anything. And this was protection. They were protecting me. The church, the people were so good. I mean, the, the neighbors were so close together. But that, that's a fine thing because even though they were so close to you, they would eat at you at each other's house. Nobody closed their doors to nobody. If I were doing bad somewhere, somebody was going to beat my tail no matter who it was. And I was going to get another one when I got home because they just. I mean, when they say a village raised a child, that is exactly what you find out there. Because if you did something wrong down there, and another black person saw you when you was a child, that's what he would do. He would say, man, who was your parents? He wouldn't even know you. He wouldn't even know you. But uh, he would chastise you if you were doing something wrong, or if you was uh, messing with something that was going to hurt somebody, you know, because Okay, so you, um, Jolene Lambert is wonderful, but she goes on for much too long, so I won't play that. But you really get the sense that 
suddenly a friend of mine, when he first saw that, said, I could teach that slide for an hour. Um, because there's so much there, both similarities and differences, the commonality of I mean, you could just really play with that. And there are many, many other examples like that we could talk about. So um, I think I'll skip this next part, because I want to get to the new stuff that we've been doing. So all of this is coming out of, and we've been doing this for about 10 years, maybe longer, um, working with ways to deal with the problem of long interviews, so that I think of it more and more as simply a way of mapping them so that you can get in, find something interesting, and pull it out and make use of it, either for research or for uh, you know, a, humanities, a humanities truck or any other public use that you might have. So then, and this is the stuff that's happened just more, more recently, almost accidentally, actually quite accidentally, we began playing with the idea of coming from completely the other end. What if it's not a long interview? And it began, oh, with my partner down in New York thinking that maybe we could make $8 billion by doing something that would get bought out by Instagram or something like that. Well, that probably is not going to happen or hasn't happened. But we were led to this idea of adding audio to photographs. Everybody's got photographs. Everybody takes photographs. Every family has a shoebox of photographs. People have photographs on their mantelpiece or other images and telling stories about them. And we ended up designing a, initially an app called Pixtory, P-I-X-S-T-O-R-I, which is available in the App Store for free on iOS, Apple, uh, iPhones, and iPads. And we developed a way to make them locally on the app and then upload them to a, a, a we call it a web portal, that can be created for a specific project. So it's a way to generate a lot of multimedia material. And a couple of quick things to say about this. Um, as a, somebody involved with oral history, as I began to get fascinated with this, um, simply in terms of thinking about what it was producing, and I was talking about it with a friend and comparing it to long form interviews, which I'd spend most of my career doing and love and have done books of them and so forth. But it's, you know, this seemed different. And he said, it really, st really stayed with me. He said, if I understand what you're saying, you're saying that the whole field of oral history has, if it were literature, it's like assuming that the only literary form is the novel. Because you do these long interviews. But what about poems? That's literature. It's not the same as a novel. You wouldn't, con you wouldn't confuse Moby Dick with you know, something else but they each have value, but they're different kinds of values. So what are the ways of thinking about short interviews that uh, might be useful? What, what issues do they raise? What problems do they have? And what capacities do they have? And this is what we've been exploring recently. So I want to run you through a very quick little thought exercise now. If you look up, look at the screen. Okay. So, and now picture an oral history collection, whatever you think that might look like. Now picture an oral history archive. Let's try to imagine what's different about that than this collection in somebody's house. It's now an archive. Now picture a collection in an archive holding up to 5,000 interviews. How expansive is that? How many galleries of shelves do you need and so forth? Now Imagine that all interviews in this collection and archive are less than a minute and a half long. Probably your imagination runs into a wall at that point. Is that impossible? Is it unimaginable? Is it certainly not oral history? What is it? This is a fourth century Byzantine mosaic in a church in Ravenna, Italy. So is this, 4th century. And this one, which takes up, oh, easily twice the size of this wall here that you're looking at, is also on, in a church in Ravenna, Italy, which is the World's Heritage Center site for Byzantine mosaics. And the point to make is that not anything in this picture is more than two centimeters square. That's what a mosaic is, tiny bits of tile, 
that if you put them together can become a picture. So we began really starting to play with the idea that these little picturies, as we call them, uh, can be made for all sorts of purposes, ultimately can then serve a larger purpose. And certainly I think have a lot of use in the kind of practice that um, you and the humanities truck project are all involved with. So this is one from a study abroad where one I wish I had been on that trip, Food and Culture of the Mediterranean. Spent two and a half weeks in Italy and, and Greece talking to winemakers and um, you know, bottlers and cheese makers and you name it, and going to the farms and stuff like that. And the students all took these pictures and all were encouraged, they didn't do a terribly great job, but it was the first time, to reflect on them. What are they seeing? What are they learning? Sometimes they did field recordings with people uh, took a still photograph of the winemaker and then got him to talk a little bit about it and so forth. So to me, every tile tells a story, all the stories can make a bigger picture, began to seem like a new kind of way to think about doing oral history in a mosaic framework. And I'm starting to call it mosaic oral history. Why not? I mean, it's a compositional approach which has a long pedigree, even longer I mean, there are incredible mosaics from Pompeii that have been unearthed, and I think back long before that. So this has been a way to make art to represent reality that has, you know, a lot of things to be said for it, as opposed to suddenly painting a giant canvas when I paint my masterpieces, as Bob Dylan says, right? So we began um, playing with this. We built the iOS app and just this spring, yeah, at the end of the spring, we launched the beta for the last thing here, a new web app platform. So a web app means it's, you don't need an app on your phone. It's in the cloud all the time. All you need is a connection. And like Facebook is in the cloud all the time. You may, have, you may reach it through your phone, but you're on Facebook. You may reach Instagram through your phone, but you're on Instagram. So now you'll be able to be in Pixtory uh, and make pictures, upload them, gather them, uh, and so forth. And the, sec the point in the middle is our main strategy, such as it is, is to look for collaborative partners who can, this is not, the app is basically free. Uh, we'd have to have eight zillion users before we could even make any money from, you know, uh, premium level special, you know, powers and all that. So the real opportunity for us now is to find people, including you all who really want to do some sustained work with this and we can in some way find ways to collaborate in that and provide a lot of back-end support and that's something I'll be talking more about with Dan and perhaps you and some others. So let me show you, this is what the original app looks like. A very simple, the picture's on your phone, you call, either take a picture or call it up from your camera roll, push the little red button, record some audio, and then you follow the thing there and you can upload it to, you can share it through social media and then upload it to a particular project portal that's been set up for you. And the portals are what, what you see in the bottom, already having a beginning of that mosaic feel to them. This is what, it doesn't actually quite look like this, it will at some point, but this is the new app on the way, Next Generation Pixtory, it's actually here. You could play with it now. You can begin to see it through um, the website for it is pixtoryplus.com, P-I-X-S-T-O-R-I-P-L-U-S.com. You have to join for free, just like you register for Instagram, and then you can join public groups, you can make your own group, and we'll, we're gonna try setting up what we're calling a sandbox for the Humanities Truck Project, and perhaps for you or anybody else. And that way you can have your own private place where you can experiment see what you can do with this and so forth. So let me show you some quick examples of, I think, what pictures can be like. This is from a friend of mine, actually the very first one that she made. This is a photograph of the stairway at the Hamburg Street House in Buffalo, New York that my great-grandfather built. I just recently was able to walk these stairs, walking through the house, up to the second floor, and I noticed it looked to be the most authentic space in the house that I could relate 
to the early years, the mid 19th century. And I thought my great grandfather walked these stairs. And we walked up the stairs and opened the door and found a young girl working on her drawings for school. And that also reminded of me about her age working on my drawings, and I thought the similarities were profound on this particular day in 2015 that I was able to enter my great-grandfather's house. You know, I, I think it's pretty remarkable. You know, it is a little bit of a poem in a way, and she wasn't thinking that way, but it comes out like that. Having only a minute or a minute and a half, she gives it a sort of shape. A friend of mine, when he heard that, said, I don't know that she actually saw that little girl. Maybe she's seeing herself as the little girl that she's, it doesn't matter, really. But she goes through this, she walks up the stair. Anyway, there's a lot going on there in a very compact amount of space. Here's another one. This is a, a 94-year-old woman talking. Now, uh, this is my office um, in New York City on Madison and 57th Street. Um, I was about, um, I'm the girl that you just see ahead above the little box there, but that's a, um, that's a uh, telephone um, switchboard. That's how big they were in those days. But this is about um, 1943, and uh, those people in my office um, were my bosses and co-workers, and um, it was a, a stamp auctioneer house, and it was a wonderful place to work, and it was a wonderful... Okay, you, I could, it goes on a while longer. So even I find and other people have too, the experience of listening to a 94-year-old woman looking at herself at age 18 and then giving, that's certainly a kind of oral history power that we often reach for in a variety of ways, and here you're getting it in the woman who made this, one associate of mine, now has, and I could share that with you if anybody's interested, about 40 of this woman going through her family photos, talk about mosaics, and in a way you get the whole story of the family in lots of ways coming out in these little, if you did an hour interview with her, you'd get some of the same stuff, but it's in some ways more powerful in these little brief sorts of things. You can use it for lots of things. This is just a fun one. Well, we'll just this stop me. on the street for noodles, they said, as we were going from uh, one town to another on uh, a day before the oral history conference. And this was probably the best meal we had for all the fancy banquets. This was just incredible. Uh, noodles and these, uh, I see six, but there were more like eight or nine dishes that came out and you sort of mixed those into the noodles and really something just on the side of the street. Another example. Here is Fiona and she's going to tell me about her drawing. What is it called? It's called a robot princess family. <gasps> Tell me, how did you come up with the beautiful design? Well, I was at school and I just came up with this design in my head. And it, if you can see really carefully, the, the outside is kind of like the frame, but it's the mommy's robots here. And this is the bigger sister, kind of, but then this is the littler sister. Oh, what a wonderful thing. And, like, you... Yeah. Okay, it goes on for a bit. So, um, <laughs> anyway, it's a lot of fun, and, and I, I'll close with this one, and then I think we can um, open some questions and some general discussions. So this is a remarkable one. I'll, I'll, I think I'll let you hear the story. This is a story I, I was with a friend, different friend, and we hadn't seen her in a long time, and we talked for an hour or two, and then we got around to the Pixary stuff, and she said, oh, that sounds really interesting, I'll download it, let's make one. And she said, you know, an hour ago you told me this story about your mother. So let, tell me that's, and it involved coffee, as you'll hear. So she said, she took, a, she took this picture, she poured a cup of coffee, took a picture, and said, now tell me the story, and she made a Pixary, and it sounds like this. Well, a family story. Throughout my adult life, when I visited my mother, who was whatever, lived by herself for a long time, 
and she would serve me dinner. At the end of the dinner, she would always bring out coffee, uh, ask if I wanted coffee, and when I said yes, she would say no, and I would say no black, and she would always say with exactly this tone, black, <laughs> like this was some great shame to want black coffee. And I just never, I was always curious about where that came from. There was something that seemed, I don't know, morally suspect about black coffee. It was just too, you know, raw or something, and it should be watered down with milk. And that this was, the other part of the story that always strikes me is that no matter how many times this happened, she never remembered. So it was like this information that I liked black coffee was just not receivable. It could not be filed. It had no place in her in her <clears throat> imaginary landscape. And so every single time she would say black and with this air of both condemnation and surprise. And the great part is my daughter Naomi is now 19, but for a few years now, loved this story. And whenever we're in a restaurant and if they say at the time of serving coffee, would you like uh, milk with that or cream? And I say black, and I only say under her breath, black. <laughs> okay, so it's a cute little story. And I began using it in a couple of conferences because as I thought about it, and I watched people, um, just as I'm watching you watching this, to me, I, I use this as an example that the photograph, I don't think even has to be anything particularly significant. There's something deeper about the way anchoring your eye allows you to listen, and uh, while you're listening, you keep looking at the picture. It, Roland Barth writes about this a lot. You enter that space of the photograph and things happen that are, you are being creative about, which is very different than video, which drags you along and tells you what to watch and what to focus. So there's something, so I, I had a little rap in some of these conference presentations about it doesn't have to be a significant photograph. It has to be just an image. And there's something about the way sound and image work together that I don't think as a medium we know very much about. And I think it's really worth exploring a lot more. But here's the kicker, and it's the thing I'll, that brings me back to my earliest work on memory. So sometime after I had done a couple of these conference presentations with this slide as part of it, somehow I ended up showing this to a, another friend, and he just got a kick out of it. And we're talking about parents, and we're talking about you know, generations, and he had his own stories. You know, he, he totally got it, totally got every aspect of the story about my mother and her imaginary landscape that couldn't imagine black, whatever. And then, out of nowhere, he turns around and he says, do you remember there was a restaurant in Buffalo called Your Host, a chain of small little luncheonettes? Uh, this is long before Starbucks, more like the Edward Hopper diner in that famous painting. He said, Your Host. I said, yeah, I remember it. There was, it was a couple of blocks from me. I used to go there a good bit. And he said, yeah, I, I used to go there every Sunday after mass with my dad. My mother was home making the Sunday dinner, and I would, we would go to early mass and come back and have breakfast at, at your host. And then he said, they had that mug. That's their mug. That's their mug. And I mean, I, I find somebody who's thought a lot about memory and thinking of this new medium, the, the power of that example, that while he was totally involved with processing my audio story, my mother's story, He's on this memory trip back to his Catholic boyhood with his dad, come, and it's like Proust, right? I mean, that one image brought back the whole thing, not just the Your Host restaurant, but the whole Sunday morning ritual and what that must have meant to him, and what the mass meant, and what it meant to have this private time with his father. You know, remarkable. And these are not getting in each other's way at all. They're all happening at the same time. They're all happening at the same time. And to me, it's a real, I think, for people involved in gathering stories from people, the notion of what can come out of this that will be surprising. I mean, certainly this was completely surprising. It actually wasn't even all that mysterious. There was a, it's a great old, there's a, a firm in Buffalo called Buffalo China, which began, we had a very famous company that Frank Lloyd Wright was 
uh, connected to, and uh, Albert Hubbard, who some of you may know about, was their advertising genius called the Larkin Company, which made soap and kind of created the consumer soap wrapped soap gift boxes. And they had a whole system of um, coupons that you would redeem for prizes and stuff like that. These clubs around the country where middle class women were having Larkin clubs to get people to buy these soap things. Very interesting merchandising at the turn of the century. And there were all these Buffalo industries that were making the premiums for that. So this dinnerware was a kind of medium end, low end. You know, now after the Larkins ended, they their niche was restaurant, which is why it's not surprising that it was in your host. But a lot of their designs went into a lot of the basic restaurant china um, that you'd see all over the country came from the um, you know the, the this Buffalo this Buffalo company, Buffalo China. Anyways, that's why your host had it. But she had it as well, and there it was. So I'd like you to think about that. Um, I'll close with just these two points. Uh, to me, it's become more and more powerful. So the unexamined assumption with oral history has been, I think, people don't talk about it because they haven't been challenged to think about it, that the natural form for oral history has got to be a long interview. And, you know, maybe not. Or maybe it's not the only natural form. Or maybe there are other, other forms. And the second thing that I'm finding really interesting in Barthian and other terms um, is the idea of photo-prompted oral histories. It's people, I mean, answering our smart-ass questions in long, probing interviews is not always, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. People love talking about photographs. And even for long interviews, I'm thinking we're working on some hybrids now. You imagine, let's say, going into a family or, or a community and having them select 10 or 15 photographs and talk about them with you, which could itself be recorded, and then make some pictures so that you have these little tiles ready to go. Then you could sit back and do a longer interview because they will have unfolded their sensibility through this more natural mode. And you could then say, you know, boy, you've made 10 of these. I keep hearing this story about luck, or this story about disappointment, or this story about what, what is it, what, what's that all about? And it's more likely, I think, than the person having already performed, in some ways, a good bit of memory work in response to photos that have meaning for them, might be able to really engage dialogically in a real conversation about that and that that would have a lot of value that simply coming in from outside and saying, let's talk about, let's get in touch with your feelings about homelessness or almost anything else may not always be the most productive, as Dan knows in a lot of his work, which has struggled you know, and done really wonderful stuff with this. How do you find, how do you get people to a place where they're comfortable and can talk and really exchange things with you rather than imposing a lot of your own values in, in questions that seem to come from a very different perspective. So it leaves me with the sense that um, particularly for place-based projects, for things based in material culture, where you can look at an object, a quilt, a tool. Uh, we have a, a, a project in uh, Milwaukee that was done using some of this with Hmong immigrants in a mostly black neighborhood who have begun transforming their houses. So you have a picture of an altar under a stairwell and a nice discussion about why I put that altar under the stairwell or uses of the porch. They did a whole little unit on that. So I think there's a lot in this. And right now, I'm still interested in indexing and still interested in long interviews and all of that. But I think there's a new world opening up. And certainly, I think the kind of work many of you are involved with would be a natural place for exploring some of this. And I hope we uh, may have a chance to collaborate um, a little bit on, on some of that. So questions or comments or anything else, as long as it's not making fun of my mother. Yes? How do you see the kind of marriage between the work you've done in indexing and this new pick story idea kind of, I don't know, coalesce or come together? So right, these are shorter um, photographs or um, audio recordings, but how are they being utilized and maybe redistributed right. or made available broadly? 
Well, people are just beginning. I mean, this is, you know, we're, we've just created the tool. So it's like a Phillips screwdriver, and we're waiting for people to figure out what they want to build with it, you know, without IKEA instructions. We, we can be a little bit of uh, IKEA, I suppose. So we're just beginning to find that out. But I'll give you one quick example, because it's very much at the top of my um, agenda right now. We have in Buffalo, a, in an African-American neighborhood, a very, it's a pretty segregated city, so this is a really almost exclusively African-American neighborhood. There's a roller skating rink called Skateland. And for 35 years, they have taken pictures of the kids and their families coming to roller skate often for birthday parties and other things like that. And they took those pictures and they put them on oak tag and created little collages. And the entire place was decorated with these collages of these photographs. And then they were about to um, head to the dumpster because they were remodeling or something, or maybe a new owner. I, I haven't quite got the story. And somebody was really concerned about this and got to a local college small Catholic college with a good librarian who was really alive to, and they said, we'll take them. We'll preserve them. And they, and they worked out a deal and they took them so that they weren't destroyed. They have digitized them, high res. They're on their website, Damon College. There are 1,600 photographs, maybe 5,000 people in these photographs, all coming out of this neighborhood over 30 years. So, the, and then they said, well, I guess, what do we do? Um, um, let's do an oral history. Well, it's clearly not going to happen. You know, I mean, who would you talk to? How, how many could you do? They have a small group of undergraduates. So then they heard about this. And now what we're planning, they're planning, and we're hoping to help with, is a major sustained crowdsourcing effort. Because this is now, we don't have an iOS app. It's up in the cloud. And they could have. Um, just a real effort to get out to that community and say, find yourself in these pictures or find something, maybe a relative or maybe a friend, any story you want to tell, push a button and tell the story. And they'll be able to do it. And if they're not comfortable doing it to themselves, they came up with the idea at another project did as well. Who's comfortable with this kind of media? Well, kids are, by and large. So what if we had what they're going to call the Pixery Rangers? Could be college students or people from the neighborhood. And they put something in the newspaper. They have five of these pictures, these collages, every week. Say, so if you recognize anybody in here or have a story about it, call this number. And then the next day, you could have a couple of kids show up at their house with their phone and look at that picture. And the, the, the photograph will be on the phone. And they could tell their story. And then gradually, you would have a buildup in this kind of lapidary accretion approach of and talk about people who are lost to history, 5,000 people in this community, some of whom you know, are working in steel mills, some of whom you know, did this, some of whom you know, went into the military, some of whom are, you know, worked in a factory, men, women, I mean, all sorts of things. They're all there, 5,000 people, mostly under the age of 14. But this is 30 years ago, so many of these people are in their 40s or 50s or 60s now. How interesting could that be? And what could you do with it if you had little thumbnail? And what we're finding, I don't want to run on too much about this, that to me has been, as I sort of try to step outside of this and think about the kind of things we're seeing, what we're finding is that people don't spend that much time um, unpacking the photograph itself. It's more of a, I, I call it, they're, they're grounded but not bounded. It's just enough of a frame. And then they bounce off of that. Quick example, somebody in a family setting, sitting there looking at a picture of a young man uh, in the Gulf War it, with his unit or standing in some place. And she says pretty much, almost verbatim, she said, that's your Uncle Eddie. You know, and uh, he's over there in the Gulf. He was there for a couple of years. You know, when that boy came back, he, he could just never find his footing. He tried this and he tried that. And she's ultimately really talking about PTSD and a lot of other. And meanwhile, while she's doing this, moving on, you're looking at this picture of this confident young man 
and you're hearing the story about all of his difficulties afterwards. I mean, talk about poems and power in just a minute and a half or two minutes. It's all right there. And then if you had an hour, you could unpack more of it. Or if you did a long interview based on that, you'd have a lot more that you could talk about. And we're finding that's more common than, you, than we would expect, that people go all sorts of places, just like my friend in that case in his imagination went back to you know, going to mass with his dad and having breakfast at your host restaurant afterwards. So you can't predict it. It's, a ki it's, it's free association, but it's not really a free association. It's a prompted association, so it's not totally random. But it ends up being not you know, coincidental either where they go with it. So uh, this is as far as I've been able. I mean, I think it's just really interesting. And I keep being struck with, if we have more experience with this, we may discover there are, as I said before, there are modes of oral history that are now made possible by, in this case, technology that open up the field in a whole set of ways that are not, I mean, if you just think about it, we've been doing interviews for a long time, back from the 1930s with the slave narratives. You know, and we know about that. It's wonderful, they're great, but that's just, what about some other modes? Certainly for field work, I think in any sort of situation, to get people, we're hoping, I did a workshop in China this summer um, where they're training people in public history. It was the, you know Li Na uh, um, in Hangzhou, China. They had a third national public, public history faculty training program, three week thing. I was there for about four days of it. And they just went wild with this. And they're really thinking they would like to have a Chinese version and which is probably reachable in some form. And the idea, one of the things that's inter interesting in terms of my sense of China is that there's a lot that you can't in oral history talk about easily because of the political controls and the nature of things. But there's a lot of concern about how completely traditional life is being you know, eliminated every day villages disappearing, whole memories disappearing. So the idea of thinking of a national project to get kids, which could be done with a mode like this, not to do long interviews, which they're not going to be able to do, much less what would you do with them, but to go through and have a curriculum and say, go sit down with your grandparents and talk about a tool, a place, a this and that, and get them to tell a story for a minute or two, and then have all these come together. The other thing that, in a way, gets also back to your question that I'll that intrigues me to the extent that I <clears throat> sometimes am um, close, closer to social science, is that all the work we've done with the long interview, which anybody's done with long interview, is to get something I mean, we, that we can then extract and analyze, in some cases, in addition to using in a documentary. So, but you have to first get it. So the idea of starting with something that's born small, that's already there, it's already a tile, and in fact, we're seeing this now in a couple of projects. If you got a lot of these little tiny stories, I mean, an Excel spreadsheet, and you could code those six ways around the middle. You know, have a different column for this one's about affect, CVS, right? This one's about so-and-so, this one's about context, this one's about demographics, and just check it off. Well, they're between 18 and 43, they're this and that, they're this and that, and then you do a quick sort in Excel, boom, 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 and you've got 14 people out of 10,000 of these little tiles. You know, a, a friend of mine sent me a wonderful slide of a mosaic workshop in, in Rome. And, you know, they didn't just have a lot of these tiles sitting around the floor. You know, I mean, at some point they must have had, you know, boxes, right? and little, you know, curved ones and black ones and red ones and, you know, so that when they're putting the thing together, well, I need something that's yellow and that has this kind of shape and they go there and they can make a choice. They're not just rummaging around in the Halloween candy kind of thing looking for, uh, you know, a Tootsie Roll. So um, I think this stuff is in some ways more amenable to real data analysis and data control and then you could put together constellations that could then either say something or at least you know, be available for uh, a more searching inquiry into how people presented with a given prompt talk about where it leads them. I mean, a lot of the, you, what you can do with this is not just people's own photographs, but many projects are going to put photographs up there 
We tried to get the people of Woodstock interested. That was on our the slide that you saw. Inter they didn't have the imagination to go for it. It wouldn't have cost them anything. We would have done it for free. But you know, they had 500,000 people at Woodstock, and they were all out there. Well, 400,000 probably still alive. And they could have put their whole photo archive up there and say, go to here, find the photo, and tell me about it. Tell me about your experience at Woodstock. And they would have gotten thousands, thousands of real stories, first person stories. Instead, they wasted all their time trying to put on a rock concert that never happened, as some of you know. So, anyway. All right, other questions? Yes? Question about this anchoring, using the photo as the anchor, um, and having the text. Well, if, if that photo and if that text was then captioned, would it destroy the anchor? I don't think so. Um, I mean, we're mostly focused on audio stories. The nice thing about the audio is that you can keep looking at the picture while you're, but even if it's text, and, and we have some automatic transcription that's built in now, so you can get it uh, out in text as well, and ultimately translation as well. So I don't think so. I mean, it's a little bit like the examples I've given. I think people, uh, they don't have any problem you know, my, my one example with the coffee cup is really good. They have no problem responding to the photo, and even when they're totally different than responding to the story. And when they in some way conjoin, they, the experience seems to be that it actually makes them more, if it was just an audio story, they feel like they're being beaten over the head with, you have to agree with me. So this way, it's little, I think of it as a space. They enter that space. I don't think we know very much about what happens in that space between image and um, sound. Among the many things I don't like about StoryCorps, um, which I won't go on about, some of you know StoryCorps on your radio, is they've been doing these absolutely I think, awful animations as if people can't listen to a story without being entertained with cartoon characters who aren't even trying to look like the people. And to me, the idea of I've done a thing, some of you um, may know the book I did with this incredible documentary photographer named Milton Rogovin, who just died a few years ago at 101. It's a great field to be in, by the way, if you want to live a long time. It seems Steichen and Stieglitz and all of them seem to go on forever. Milton was 101. And we did a book called Portraits in Steel, which were oral histories with a selection of his steelworker photos in Buffalo, all of whom were people who <clears throat> were no longer steel workers because all of the steel mills closed that they worked in. So I did these life history oral, oral interviews. And we did an experiment, which I, I can send to Dan and anybody, if this is on Dropbox and you can look at it there and download it, where we simply put together, using Interclipper, some audio clips together with his photographs. And the difference of looking into a portrait his are magnificent photos. Looking into a portrait while you're listening to the voice of that person. And when this was shown, this kind of blew me away, I must say, because um, it just seemed like a, both an obvious and a, a nice thing to do. Uh, when there are a couple of, Milton's work keeps being shown, so there was a, a number of big exhibits. One of them was in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, at the Height Museum of the University of Louisville. And so they had a little installation with this little video we made, which are for the subjects and their own voices. And the curator said, uh, which I didn't quite believe, but I believe I come to sense that it's probably true that uh, in the long history of documentary photography, he couldn't think of almost any examples on a sustained basis where you actually could look into documentary photographs, particularly of working people and hear the voice of the person himself, which seems like a really obvious thing to do. We know that voice carries meaning, and a good photograph carries meaning, and you put them together, and you've got meaning plus meaning equals you know, exponential meaning. And, and it's true. You look at it. You keep looking at that. And as the personality unfolds, you keep looking more deeply into the picture. I've seen, when I had done this, and I noticed things in the, those pictures, that I hadn't in working on the book for five years that I'd never really noticed. Because I was sitting there listening to Doris McKinney go on for 45 seconds or a minute and a half or whatever, and then notice some things in the photograph that 
had escaped me before. So uh, I think it's a surprisingly powerful mode. The better, the, the more interesting the image is, certainly for, for portraits. I, I was talking with Dan about the exhibit that you have up in the truck now. Be really easy to get little, you to use something like Pixtree or some other ways it could be done as well and have a screen where people could look at that thing and then go there and push a button with the same photograph and hear that person's voice. Why would you not want to do that? So I think you should. Yes? I have a question about um, thinking about this from a research perspective versus like a consumer uh, like memory tool. Mm -hmm. um, because Instagram, you can take pictures. There's, your, my phone comes with ways of recording audio. Uh, in, in some ways, you're, you're gathering these, um, but as a research tool, you, are you tempted to, to constrain the process and say, for example, we want to know if the person picked their own pictures versus I pushed the picture at them and had them respond to this picture. Those could be very different power relations. Right. Uh, and that might be something that, as researchers, we'd be very interested in, but if it's a consumer tool, it just slows down the process. Let's get all those things out and make it as simple yeah. as possible. Um, are, how do you think about balancing those and well, trying to make sure it's useful as a research tool? Well, I mean, this is all brand new. So we're kind of, you know, I mean, ultimately we're, we hide behind the fact that that's up to you. I mean, it's a tool and it can be used in different ways. And we're doing a lot now to kind of respond to what people feel they need. I mean, they're, you know, it's, it's a fairly early stage. So there are capacities that it would be nice to have that aren't there yet. So the more we get a sense of what people would maximize its usefulness for them. I mean, like we just have a new thing that uh, looks like we'll be able to get a lot of the data out. There's a lot of metadata within these things and we can now export it and put it into Excel spreadsheets and so that you could work analytically with the material for research purposes um, outside of the actual interface. So that's an example. There's, I mean, a, a number of others. So, I mean, I think our feeling right now is we want to get it in people's hands and see what they need for lots of purposes. I mean, sometimes it's, and they, it can be all over the place. You know, I mean, we're, I mean, we're trying, because we have no support except what we can, you know, occasionally raise um, through some of these things. But I mean, one of our prime areas is like looking at alumni associations who are in the business of trying to reach out to alumni and get them involved, and they all have stories. So why would you not want to try to from their point of view, monetize that in terms of making them feel good. What if somebody, professor so-and-so is retiring and, and they've been there for 25 years and you could put some pictures up and send that out to 15,000 alumni and say, if you have a story about professor so-and-so, push a button and tell it to us. And that could be useful. In other ways, it could be used in more serious ways as well. So I, I think we're, it's so new that we just want to get it in people's hands and see where they want to go with it. And then to the extent that we can begin to customize a little bit and reach some of these different objectives. I think there'll be some of those tensions there. I mean, my partner is much more, comes out of market research. So he's really thinking about, you know, reaching mass audiences that could monetize everything, you know, which I don't think is likely to happen. But um, uh, maybe, you know. But in the, in the immediate time, I'm actually quite comfortable. The areas we've been most successful on have been with projects like this and, and other university-based things that are involved in public history, who are really interested in and who really want to imagine a project like the Skateland thing, which is coming out of a college library, a new way of relating to communities. So uh, I think those things will give us a lot more to work with, and we'll see where it goes. Others? Thank you for your patience, God. I think we've gone, at least we got a little darkness so we can see the slides better. Anything else? Other things? Yes? Um, if, um, hello? Oh, that, I'm sorry, that's just recording you. These are, oh. this is the only one using them. Oh, okay. Just a reminder, we were unable to hear very well without the microphone. So I would like if you can share with us any um, experience uh, you consider important uh, when oral history or um, the big story has been used 
uh, for social justice purposes uh, and if it have had had, had su success uh, in a social struggle um, of any type. Well, certainly in oral in oral history, you know, plenty. Um, I mean, there are projects all over the place that are fundamentally oriented around that. This is really still so new that I don't think we've seen too many applied examples of that yet, but um, people seem to be interested in the fact that it seems to have a lot of potential in that area because in unlike oral history, which in some way the traditional conventional approach still involves sitting down and getting people to you know, participate in long interviews, this is a way that could privilege a much more spontaneous um, harvesting of their own sensibility and their, and their memories and then provide for collaborative ways. Maybe the closest example is in these projects in Milwaukee, um, which was a, a summer field school that came out of the School of Architecture. And they had students in a community for five weeks and uh, communities that were involved with a great many social justice issues in terms of their own dynamics. And they really found it quite possible, this was only part of what they did, but it was a, an important part, to think of co-curated exhibits because there was stuff that could be worked with. You can't, it's not realistic to say we're going to train everybody to edit long interviews, for example, or to work the complicated indexing things. But people can go through a lot of these and say what's important to them. And so I think that potential of helping um, literally curate, share the curation process in a, a community-based way with materials that are more amenable to a kind of flexible curation might be a really important area. And then people can go from there. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you very much.